So today uh, we are going to focus on color and phenolic compound management, trying to be actually a little bit more practical uh, than uh, too much chemistry. Even if I say this, I do have to start with chemistry because when we start about talking about phenolic compounds, we need to understand a little bit which one we're talking about. So in uh, the wine, we can find phenolic compounds from two big families, the non-hydrolyzable and the hydrolyzable. The non-hydrolyzable have two categories, non-flavonoids, which are present in the flesh of the grape, and the flavonoids that are present in the skin, the seeds, and the stems. The non-flavonoids are the hydroxycinamic acids, um, very easy to oxidize phenolic compounds. The flavonoids are anthocyanins that are responsible of wine color. So the red or brown or purple color you find is always due to anthocyanin, which is in reality the molecule that gives color to other plant too. Um, they are present in the skin, they are water soluble, and they are charged, positively charged, which means they are highly reactive and they can react with anything they find. You want them to react with a tannin that will stabilize it, uh, which is not always the case, but we will talk about how to make it happen. The flavonols uh, is also a category of um, phenolic compounds under the flavonoids. Flavonols are uh, considered as copigments. They are these small phenolic compounds that can, can copigment the anthocyanin as a sandwich, so one under, one on the top. And uh, this will help stabilizing the anthocyanin and maintaining its color. Also, it happened that there is some studies that show that wine uh, with high content of flavonols are associated with higher value. Uh, this was like a consumer study that's really uh, asking people how much they would consider this wine is, and we correlate, correlate this with the flavonol content and it matched pretty good. Then the condensed tannins. Condensed tannins are present in the skin and in the seeds. The condensed tannins are um, units, a chain of units of a catechin, epicatechin, or epigallocatechin. Um, and the, usually we have longer chain in the skin and shorter chain in the seeds. These tannins are very reactive with anthocyanin, but also they are participating to the mouth feed. The next category is the hydrolyzable, as I was telling you, and these are gallic and elagic tannins, which are usually coming from the wood. Very reactive with protein, um, but not necessarily uh, present uh, naturally in the grapes. Okay, so these are the phenolic compounds in red grapes. One of the first steps um, that we're going to talk about is uh, extraction. These compounds are present in the skin of the berries, so we do have some work on extraction to do. Also, what happens is that usually um, the anthocyanins, since they are water soluble, they can be extracted faster than the tannins, and that can cause a problem because they are going to react with other compounds and we're going to lose them. So we're going to talk about this too. So the different way to um, extract compounds from the skins, there is many in winemaking, so I'm going to talk about all of them very quickly, but you can do crushing. Crushing will improve or increase the extraction of skin and seed uh, as well, but they also it also promotes oxidation, so uh, there is some negative side effect about crushing. Cold soak. Cold soak, there is many studies on cold soak and some show that yes, it does work and you end up with a wine with more color and more stable, uh, but also sometimes it doesn't work and you actually oxidize your anthocyanin that you extracted without extracting any tannins to stabilize it and you got the opposite effect. So it's very variety dependent and I'm happy to talk more about it by variety with you after. Saignet. Saignet is a technique that basically you are draining the juice that just uh, came out of um, your, uh, your, your berries, your grapes. This uh, is just a concentration. So basically we're removing the juice, increasing the ratio skin juice. So there is more skin um, than before related to the juice. So it means that we extract more and we concentrate more. Okay, so that's a very good technique for anthocyanin and skin tannin extraction. 
SO2, SO2 can be used as a solvent. Um, so sulfur acts very strongly as a solvent, so it's gonna extract a lot of compounds from the skin. Uh, unfortunately, it can also, it has a lot of side effects, which means, which can be, um, well, extracting everything from the skin, even the off aromas that you don't want. Uh, but also um, it's an inhibitor for um, fermentation. So alcoholic and malolactic, you take the risk to have a reduction issue and it's bleaching the color. So you extract color, but you bleach it. Enzymes, extraction enzymes are actually one of the best tools you can use to really uh, extract in a selective way and not have any side effect. So you actually uh, do extract, but also improve color stability because you extract tannins too, and you improve filtrability, clarification. We'll talk more about the enzyme. Thermovinification, that's uh, a way to cap management. So you can deal with delestage, you can deal with pump over, you can deal with punch down. Um, that's all uh, depending on the volume you do and how frequently you do it, you're gonna change the uh, extraction dynamic and the amount of um, anthocyanin and polyphenol you will find in your wine. The temperature of fermentation is very important. The higher the temperature and the more phenolic extraction we get, also we get more polymeric pigment, so we get more anthocyanin that got combined. Higher temperature, all the reactions happen faster. And then extended maceration. So this will give you a higher extraction of seeds. Um, so be careful because if you focus on the seed, it means that your seeds are ripe. So you want your seed to be brown and ripe. Green seeds tend to be very bitter, very astringent and not give you any positive effect. So focusing a little bit more on the enzyme. Um, this is uh, the, um, well, the image of a berry, okay? There is a little seed here. And basically what we are looking here is the different cells. In the flesh, it's very easy to extract compounds from the flesh because the cells are very thin and they basically, as soon as you um, press, you can, or, you know, any movement, you're gonna extract them, the juice and the compound. But the color and the phenolic compounds are from the cells, uh, closer to the skin, which, as you can see, have much thicker cell walls that are harder to extract. So when we get closer to the skin, we get really thick cell walls, complex pectin matrix with branch uh, pectin chains. Uh, so it is much harder to uh, break down, to lose down and to extract compounds from the cells. Well, when we're inside, it's much thinner. So, this said, the enzyme is here, it's a pectinase, a uh, nozim crush red, and it's here to lose down the network of pectin, this complex pectin, and to really help extracting compounds that are from uh, the cells closer to the skin. So this is just to give you an example how it works here. Uh, I'm showing you three pictures of um, a test that we did, which is a coloration of sheath. Uh, this test color, colors the polysaccharide present in the cell walls. So as you can see, the control has a lot of polysaccharide. Everything is pink because there is polysaccharide everywhere, which makes the cell walls very hard and we can't really extract as good. Um, enzyme X, which is our uh, competitor enzyme, uh, extraction enzyme, does a very selective hydrolysis of some cells, but they don't attack much uh, the complex pectin because as you can see, uh, the cells that are close to the skin are still very pink, which means we didn't um, attack or lose the network of polysaccharide. So the extraction is not going to happen and there is no more polysaccharide in the flesh uh, cells, which means we are going to get very mushy. Anosim crush red, as you can see, hydrolyze, hydrolyzes a little bit everything. So we did lose down the complex pectin matrix, but also linear pectin chain uh, from the inside the flesh to close to the skin to really uh, favor the extraction uh, without getting mushy. Okay, so that's what's very important for us when we develop an ozim crush red. Now, what is it? It is a liquid pectinase. We uh, have a pectinase that is highly purified in cinnamylesterase and anthocyanase. Why purified? Because 
we want to make sure we do not create any um, precursors of volatile phenols uh, for the bread. So that's the cinnamyl esterase and anthocyanase. We want to make sure we extract anthocyanin, but we don't degrade, degrade them. Uh, and so that's this activity. Highly concentrated, we use 10 to 30 milliliters per ton. So it's very low dosage. And in terms of results, you can see it here by yourself. So we are comparing a control with the enzyme X of before and the nozim crush red. As you can see, the enzyme X and the control don't have much difference in terms of color while a nose in crash red at 30 ml per ton, put on grapes, this is final wine post malolactic. You can see that basically we increased the color, but most, like, most importantly, we increased the red color. We also increased the amount of phenolic compounds at the little dot that you see. So we increase the color, but we improve the color stability too, because post fermentation, we still have it. We are improving the mouse peel by increasing the amount of polysaccharide that we uh, release. We are increasing the qualitative volume by losing down like this, all these cell walls. We are actually increasing uh, the free run volume, three to five percent, three to six percent actually. And we also improve the filtration and settling properties of the wine. These are very general numbers that we uh, summarize with many different trials on different varieties. And so you can see that in general, we always have better color, plus 11% in the color intensity. We have more tannins, plus 15%. Better yield of free run, plus 4%. So uh, we don't have to press as strong. We have less prag. Less prag means less uh, pectin that inhibits the filtration. So we are improving filtrability. And we have more Rg2, which are the polysaccharides that participate to co-pigmentation of color, but also mouthfeel and uh, color and tartrate stability. Okay, so that's very important. We, we are actually winning in many other points than just extraction with this enzyme. Okay, the next step now that we extracted is to be pro to protect. So as I was telling you, we extract much faster than the cyanin than the tannins but the anthocyanin is unstable and can react with many things. So we want to make sure we protect this anthocyanin and we protect our tannins too. Why? Because we can lose these phenolic compounds by oxidation and by reaction with protein. So what happened is by oxidation, you probably know this reaction already, you saw it 10,000 times, um, but basically a phenol. So when we are talking about juice, we are talking about enzymatic oxidation. So phenol will get oxidized by the presence of oxygen and lacase of poly polyphenol oxidase, PPO here, into a quinone. This quinone is going to react with glutathione first. So that's a natural antioxidant protection of the grapes. Uh, they can catch the quinone. Once they don't have any glutathione, it's going to polymerize with other phenolic compounds, creating browning, but also precipitation of color which means these phenolic compounds, so tannins and uh, anthocyanin, will not be available anymore in the wine. We lose color, we lose structure. And next, it can oxidize aromas, uh, which is not cool either. Loss by a reaction of protein, that's what happened a lot in um, red wine. When we're talking about wine wine, we actually promote this reaction to remove protein uh, from um, from the juice uh, by adding tannins to this. So what happened is basically protein and tannin uh, can react together forming agglomeration uh, and then precipitation. So to not lose, and we extract protein as soon as we have juice. So to not lose our tannins, we have to protect from oxidation and also protect from reaction with protein. This, for this, we developed a tannin, another tannin that is actually going to be reacting faster than your own tannin. So we call it sacrificial tannin because uh, protanin R um, that I'm talking about here is going to react faster than your own phenolic compounds with protein and with oxygen radical protecting them. It's going to um, act as a shield, basically. So it's a pure protocyanic tannin. It has a strong uh, oxygen radical scavenger ability and high affinity with protein. We use 120 to 180 grams per ton 
And as um, that's one of the particularity and one of the um, big feedback of our um, of winemakers that use protein R is that you can use it directly on the grapes. You don't need to rehydrate it. You don't need to prepare a solution. You don't lose half of the tannins because they get stick or stuck at the end of the bottom of the bucket. You can just sprinkle the tannin on the grapes. It's instantaneously soluble. What it does in the wine, it's gonna react with protein. So it does protein removal. It's gonna inhibit the lacase and PPO. It's gonna improve color stability. It's gonna improve clarification because it does react with some protein and pectins that really you need to settle and it will preserve uh, the grape potential. So here I have a little animation to make you understand a little bit better how it can work. Your control with all your tannin you extracted from your grapes and the one that you put protanin R plus all the tannin you extracted from your grapes. Then we have the proteins, okay? You also have oxygen radicals, but I'm not putting it here. Uh, it will be more, but you have proteins, which with the dosage I'm giving you, 20, 120 to 180, you would never really go higher than the protein. So you would not have protein R as residual. If you don't catch all the protein from the grapes, you will catch the protein that are there during fermentation. So what happens is tannin protein agglomerate precipitate. We end up with actually much more tannins at the end in the wine not because we have the protein R inside, but because we protected our own tannins. Okay, so that's a strategy and an approach that is very efficient um, to protect and prevent uh, the um, loss of your own potential. Some results about protein R, um, a picture to start, as you can see. So um, on this picture, we are talking uh, a gram per hectoliters, but imagine we are about from 80 to 150 gram per ton in this picture here. Um, but you may, mainly what you want to see is the color of the wine that completely improved as soon as we use protein R, but also the cloudiness. So this wine was having some lacase issue and basically um, the cloudiness or the haze that you see here is due to a protein instability that we don't have in the wine where we added protein R. Some results here, uh, looking at the color, you can see that basically the um, color intensity is all, almost double um, after malolactic fermentation while, while we put the protein R on grapes. And the amount of uh, the polyphenol index uh, is also almost double uh, from the control to the protein R. The polyphenol index is a little green dot here. Then if we look at the stability of this color, um, that's a very interesting thing because we are adding protein R on grapes, then nothing happened. And here we are looking at uh, the stability of the color after the first racking, so which means after malo, and then the second racking, which is nine months after. So you can see here that basically, uh, we look at the delta NTU, the lower the delta NTU is, the more stable is the color. Um, we want to be, usually under 12, 15 to 12. So of course we are not stable, but we're very young wine here, but you can see that after the first racking, we already have a better uh, stability with protein R, but after the second racking, which we didn't add anything, what we did is protect our own phenolic compound that start to react with anthocyanin, we have a much better um, color stability. So this has an effect that lasts in time because we protect your own phenolic compound. So after protection, so that was all about, we protect um, your phenolic compounds, your phenolic potential, okay? Now we have to stabilize. We have to stabilize our anthocyanin that has been extracted very early and needs to be stabilized before she reacts with something else. And we need to stabilize long-term. So there is two ways condensation can happen. So there is uh, anthocyanin tannin that can happen, reaction, direct reaction that can happen during fermentation or tannin anthocyanin um, reaction, direct linked. As you can see in the molecule, they don't have exactly the same color um, expression. 
Then we have anthocyanin, anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge. This is the best molecule we want to have. Uh, that's our, um, that will be our focus because it is the most stable molecule uh, in the life of the wine. But you need free anthocyanin, you need ethanol, and you need free tannin at this step. And then, usually that's more during aging, but we have the condensation with pelagic tannins that uh, happen with time and we've also uh, give you a very nice purple color. Okay. Also, another way to stabilize uh, anthocyanin is the copigmentation. Copigmentation has a hyperchromic and batochromic effect, which means, hyperchromic means we are increasing uh, the intensity of the color, what we see uh, as intensity of color. Batochromic is, means that we shift the hue uh, for something that is actually more purpley. So we see it brighter, we see it more intense. Okay, it all depends on temperature, the pH of the wine, but also the amount of copigment and pigment uh, that we have. This is usually based on weak bonds, so it's not as long term as the condensation I showed you before. Basically, you have your anthocyanin that can com combine or copigment with uh, flavonols. We talked about the flavonols before, they are present in the skin too, and they can do a reaction of sandwich. You don't have the uh, next uh, flavonol here under the anthocyanin, but they do a sandwich reaction that is um, oscillating like this all the time with anthocyanin in it. You have monoprotein. Uh, that's a very easy um, way to understand it. When you age your wine for a longer time uh, on lease, you usually find that the color is stable or more stable than if you don't age it on lease. That's the manoprotein that are released from the yeast are actually having uh, this effect of copigmentation, protecting the anthocyanin, but also stabilizing them. The last thing is uh, polysaccharide. So some of them are the Rg2 that we talked about previously with um, that are polysaccharide present in the skin. Anosine crush red can help you uh, extracting them, but also it can be Arabic gum, uh, for example, that you can add just pre-bottling to really co-pigment whatever anthocyanin is not stable yet. Okay, so we are um, going to talk today about three different um, two tannins and one uh, manoprotein for this purpose. The first one I want to talk about is soft tannin vinification, which is a tannin uh, bounded to a polysaccharide that we develop for color stability, color stabilization early in the fermentation. I want to show you very quickly a test that we do to select our tannins, which is a test of polymerization by ethanol. We have a solution of tannins, we add ethanol in it, and it's going to create a cloud. This is going to tell us how um, the tannin can react to do anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge, so the molecule we are looking for. So the haze intensity gives you the tannin efficiency, so how efficient is going to be the tannin, and the speed of the haze appearance gives you the reactivity of the tannin, how fast this tannin is going to react with anthocyanin to fix color. And this is the type of result we obtain. As you can see here, the one that has the highest NTU is the soft tannin vinification and the grape tannin. And the fastest to get the high NTU is soft tannin vinification. So that's how we selected it. Soft tannin vinification is actually a blend of catechin that is bonded to a plant polysaccharide. So we do play, uh, we are actually doing a condensation that is already copigmented with a plant polysaccharide. Okay, so we are playing on both ways to stabilize color with a tannin that is very efficient and very reactive. Some results, uh, so sorry, the application would be 150 to 200 grams per ton early to mid fermentation. Let me show you some results. Here we are looking at the Grenache thermovinified, which usually it's an extreme situation uh, because thermovinification is great to extract a lot of color. But very fast, but then if we don't stabilize it, we lose all of it. And basically, here are the results. You can see the picture. Uh, when we use the soft envy, the wine appears to be much more colored. Um, with, in fact, we lose that color stabilization six months after 
fermentation, the control lost already 40% of the color, while the soft envy lost only 20. And then if we look at the mouthfeel, because it, it's great to talk about adding tannins, but we want to make sure the mouthfeel is fine. Of course, we have a better color, but in reality, we have a wine that is more balanced, more complex, more structured, softer, and with a longer length. So a wine that is much more interesting than the control because we stabilize and we protected our uh, own phenolic compounds. So we do have better structure, but also because soft V is attached to uh, plant polysaccharide, it is a very soft and gentle tannin in terms of mouthfeel. Other results, um, I couldn't choose, so I wanted to show you all. Um, here, the addition of soft tan vinification in a Pinot Noir at 150 grams per ton. We are looking at three months post malolactic and a Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux at 180 grams per ton. Here is a total phenolic index. So you can see that in the Pinot or in the um, cab, both, we have an increase of um, total phenolic index. In terms of color intensity, Pinot and Cab both show an increase in terms of color intensity. And in terms of color stability, both Pinot and Cab uh, are showing a color that is more stable. So we have a lower uh, delta NTU when we are measuring uh, the stability of the wine three months post malolactic fermentation. So it's a pretty impressive uh, product that used during fermentation really doesn't impact uh, the taste of the wine, it does fill the meat palette, it does give roundness and structure, but most importantly, it stabilizes color in the long term. The next one I want to talk about uh, is Nature Soft. So Nature Soft is a manoprotein, so it's a yeast derivative rich in manoprotein that we will here focus more on co-pigmentation. It is a great tool if you don't want to add tannin, it is a great tool for any wine that has, are very rich in tannin, very rich in anthocyanin, but you can't stabilize them. Okay, so here I just show you um, some studies that show that manoprotein can interact with phenolic compound as a stabilizer. So we are looking at the control and then we are looking at two different manoprotein extracted from different yeast and the gelatic index show you the astringency and you can see that depending on the amount of protein we use, uh, both of them reduce astringency, but one is much more efficient than the other, which is the MP2. PVPP index, which show color stability, same thing here. And the internal index shows sweetness, same thing here. Both manoprotein increase sweetness or increase color stability, but one is more efficient than the other. That's what we uh, use to develop Nature Soft. So Nature Soft is a very, it's a specific yeast derivative or yeast extract that is rich in stabilizing manoprotein. Uh, we use it during or post fermentation to balance mouthfeel, to stabilize color. Also, I have been using it a lot on any um, aggressivity related to green character or uh, smoke. Uh, this uh, Nature Soft has been used a lot in um, situation that we are concerned about smoke and ashy character, it helps to round up the palate and eliminate this effect. Application is 20 to 40 grams per hectoliter. Some results here. Um, looking at the Delta NTU, again, we are looking at the finished wine here and we want to see how stable we are. And you can see that the control is not stable. Our competitor here is not stable, but Nature Soft is stable. So we achieve color stability just by adding Nature Soft during aging. Here on the Merlot, we are looking at each compound and we look at how much uh, basically um, anthocyanin, each different anthocyanin we have in the wine. And you can see that in almost all of them, we always have more when we added uh, Nature Soft because we protected them, because we co-pigmented them and they are protected from any reaction uh, with other compounds that will lose them. The last one, I uh, wanted to show you also the impact on the mouthfeel. And as you can see, Nature Soft is a pink curve here. Nature Soft show 
much rounder, much more sweetness, less astringency and less dryness in the mouth. Because today we are talking color stability. Uh, you can see that also we reach color stability with Nature Soft, while the control was not. Okay, so a great tool if you don't want to add more tannins, you can use it in combination with Soft and V as well. Um, they can be used both. They can be used separate. Uh, it's uh, up to uh, the first, the wine we are talking about and the grape variety we are talking about. The last tannin I want to talk about is a tannin that we used for aging. So before we are talking fermentation, nature soft can be used during aging too. But here, uh, once ferment both fermentation are done, we are focusing on the anthocyanin, anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge, the molecule of stability, color stability. So the ethanol formation here, it's interesting to look at it. During fermentation, you have a lot of ethanol happening, but it's consumed by the yeast. So usually you don't stabilize so much, a little bit, and that's why soft and V can be very helpful with ethanol presence. Then malolactic, the bacteria are consuming uh, ethanol as well. Once malolactic is done, that's where we are on the aging part. And some people would use microox to um, help stabilizing color and also work on the mouthfeel. And some people just uh, leave it in barrel and let it um, naturally microox, microoxing. You produce some ethanol when you have some uh, aging with oxygen uh, involvement. And it is a very good tool to use a tannin that will react strongly for it uh, to stabilize color using the ethanol. So you don't get oxidized, you don't create too much ethanol, you don't change your redox potential, but you use this ethanol to stabilize your color. And so that's how we came out with tan excellence. Okay, so tan excellence is a tannin that is a grape tannin and oak tannin. So we are actually covering really condensation for aging with the anthocyanin ethanol tannin um, molecule and also the condensation with elagic tannin. We use it post malolactic, usually during microoxygenation or during aging uh, in barrel. 5 to 20 grams per hectoliters, that's the dosage we recommend. Here is again uh, the test by um, polymerization of ethanol that I was uh, telling you before with the soft NV. We did the same here and we um, tried to select the tannin that was reacting the fastest um, with color. And here it is, uh, tan excellence uh, shows a better result. Three months post malolactic fermentation, we are looking at um, our uh, color uh, intensity here. You can see that in three months, our control lost 8% of its color, while tan excellence was starting higher just because we protected some uh, already by using tan excellence, plus 5%. But three months after, we were having even more because we did protect and because by um, making this anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge, we have an intensity of the color that is actually stronger. So we change the intensity of the color, which makes our uh, color even more intense. Okay, so tan excellence is a great uh, tool for aging when you feel you still have one step to do to protect your color. You have a long aging, you want to work on your aging potential. That's uh, the tannin that is uh, the most efficient at this step. So in conclusion, uh, the critical points for color stabilization would be, of course, starting with uh, a great potential. And let's consider we have 100% of our potential. We want to protect it. So once we extract it, we protect it, protein R, to cover the um, protein and the oxygen radical and to protect our own uh, phenolic pool. Then we want to extract. Uh, they go together usually, but you use an osim crush red to extract tannins, anthocyanin, but also polysaccharide that are going to be very useful for co-pigmentation, for mouthfeel, and for stability over time. During fermentation, soft tan vinification and or nature soft are the two tools you can use uh, in addition to fermentation of temperature, cap management, um, and other techniques to stabilize color, usually we go to pressing, 
and to increase your aging potential, we are um, recommending to use Tan Excellence, which is our blend of grape and oak tannins at 10 grams per hectolitre in this case, combined with microox or not. Okay, these are um, critical points uh, that will really help you having a wine that is more powerful in terms of phenolic compounds, but also a more stable, intense color. Few things that you can also do that are not necessarily directly related to color, but will impact it. And I will give you one example is about sulfur. So we saw that sulfur can act as a solvent, but sulfur also acts as a bleaching. So it bleach your color. So we realize that if we don't use sulfur on grapes, but we still protect our grape from microbial and um, oxygenation, oxidation, we end up with a better color, more vibrant, more intense and better. And for this, we have to be careful with microbial first. Uh, we recommend to use Excellence B Nature, which is our non-saccharomyces yeast, um, pure Machnikovia pulcherima that doesn't ferment, that is a perfect alternative to sulfur for microbial control. You already have protein R for oxidation. Once you arrive to the aging potential, that's usually when your second add of sulfur. And here as well, we saw that delaying this sulfur add will improve the color intensity and stability. Using kilbret instead of sulfur will help you controlling your uh, microbial spoilage and avoid any spoilage. Kilbret is a pure ketosan that we recommend to use um, after malolactic. Okay, so these are the different steps you can take to stabilize color and have a more stable and intense color with stronger structure too. Thank you very much for your attention. I uh, hope you have a lot of questions and I see you next time.